So we're in Acts chapter 19, and we took it up to uh, really the first phrase in verse 17 last week. So we'll kind of pick it up from there. Most of you, even if you missed it, probably at some point have heard the story about the seven sons of Sceva who got their butts whipped by a demon. These were uh, the sons of a, a Jewish chief priest, and during this time of Paul's ministry in Ephesus, it became somewhat of a fad, somewhat of a trendy thing for the ex uh, exorcist to take it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had demonic spirits. In fact, they were actually going out, it appears, and seeking to find people who they thought were demonically oppressed, possessed, what have you, and through calling the name of Jesus over them to sort of put on a show. So we come here to Acts chapter 19 and verse 17, having talked quite a bit about these uh, particular exorcists, the uh, sons of Sceva, last week. But we'll kind of back it up just a few verses to sort of review what we talked about, and then we'll move further into verse 17. So if you would start with me at verse 11, Acts chapter 19. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and diseases left them and evil spirits went out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists, they were traveling around casting out demons or at least that was their intent, took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exercise you by Jesus, the Jesus whom Paul preaches. So these guys, of course, they don't know Jesus. They don't even really know Paul. They have a second-rate association to Jesus Christ. It's not a real relationship. Verse 14, Also, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. So they follow this pattern. They're going uh, about using the name of this Jesus whose Paul uh, has been preaching, but they don't actually know this Jesus. They don't have a real relationship. And so they did so, and verse 15 tells us, the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And we talked about a lot last week how if you don't have a real relationship with Christ, not only can you not stand against the devil, but eventually the devil will call your bluff and God will allow him to call your bluff. You'll end up losing some skin and some clothes like these guys did because... If you, without a relationship with Christ, or if you who have a rocky relationship with Jesus, you're not really walking with Jesus, were able to take his name and to pull it out like a MasterCard whenever you needed to get yourself out of a jam, then people would begin to get the wrong idea about Christianity. And in fact, that was what was starting to happen. A name only Christianity had started to spread through Asia Minor, much like we, what we have in America today. And see, the thing is, is Christ, uh, Christians who don't really know Jesus don't scare Satan at all. In fact, you can take all the fish stickers and t-shirts you want, and Satan will eat your fish stickers. He doesn't care about your t-shirts because you don't have the authority of the kingdom of God on your life and there's no devil on the planet who doesn't see right through that whenever you approach using the name of Jesus like some badge from a hundred yards away. They can see that came, thing came out of one of them little game machines in the grocery store. It's plastic says Spongebob on it or something like that. It's not real. And these guys would experience this. 
Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? Verse 16, then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped upon them and overpowered them, prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Now I want you to imagine how they walked into the house. They're the sons of a chief priest who's known in this area. And they've got this new method using the name of Jesus. And here they come into this house and, and they're in their priestly garments and they're very confident and they're going to make a show of delivering this gentleman inside the home who's likely known to be filled with demonic spirits. They're going to make a show and they're going to, in doing so, make a name for themselves. And so some people, because they would no doubt have gained some attention, being the sons of the chief priests, had taken notice that they went inside the home because we later learn in verse 17, this became known. And so more than likely, they would wait to see what would transpire after they walked inside. Maybe they heard some noises, we don't know, there isn't a description given, but what we do know is that for anyone who was observing this, the next thing they saw after seeing them disappear into the house was some naked, bleeding, wounded men running out, screaming. And I don't know if you've ever seen a grown man who's genuinely afraid, but it is a sight. It really is a sight. It's not like when a child is afraid. When a grown man experiences real fear, I've seen this in prison a few times where men were standing before knives that were inches away from taking their lives and they were contemplating in those moments whether or not the breaths they were drawing in would be their last. And you want to see fear. I'm talking about men climbing gates like Spider-Man that can't even hardly walk because of the adrenaline that fear brings on a person. And if you could imagine these men coming out screaming, completely afraid and butt naked so far as we can tell, this began to spread all through town. Spread beyond town. Skiva, the daddy, no doubt, found out about this, probably uh, was mocked for this. Yeah, heard about your sons, man. Heard they ran out of somebody's house butt naked and bleeding last week. What's up with that, dude? And so the Bible tells us this became known, beginning of verse 17, both to all Jews, definitely spread in their camp. And I, and I bet you that those Jewish exorcists, those vagabond Jews, those itinerant Jewish exorcists, they probably started to disappear pretty quickly. Because this was a warning. Hey, don't keep doing this. I let you get away with this a few times in my sovereignty. I let you call the name of, of Jesus over a devil. You know, you eat, living for hell, and here you are at the, the, the threat of being vanquished because grandma taught you to call Jesus. And God in His sovereignty may have spared you, and these guys had experienced this, and now God is warning them, hey, you know, don't, don't keep doing with that. Don't, don't keep playing with my son's name because just like the devil called those guys bluff, I'm going to let him call you bluff. And the enemy at some point will always call your bluff if you're not real, if you're an imposter, if you're a fake, if your relationship with Jesus is not on good ground. So it became known to the Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus. And then notice this next phrase. Fear fell on them. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. This is simple. This is meant to be read in its context. The people saw evil manifested and its ability to do violence to them. These people were engulfed in the pagan culture of the worship of Artemis, the goddess, 
that had a temple in Ephesus, which in this day was one of the seven wonders of the world, probably the greatest wonder, the way the historians describe it in its time. And they were exporters of the worship of Artemis throughout all Asia and the entire known world of this day. And I can guarantee you that they didn't look at the goddess Diana like some ominous figure to be afraid of. Like uh, some evil entity that might hurt them or want to destroy them or have uh, wicked uh, plans for them. But what had started happening now was the true face of this pagan culture was being exposed. And see, the devil, we learn from 2 Corinthians chapter 11, masquerades himself as an angel of light. He'll always present himself as benevolent, righteous, good intention. In fact, when you look at the religions of the world, Buddhism, Islam, Hinduism, Sikhism, Taoism, you just go right through the list, New Age. They all present themselves to be uh, basically uh, hinged upon the same principles. Doing good to other people, treating other people, you know, nicely to each his own. Being kind, being fair, being honest. And so they present themselves as benevolent. And there's no reason for us to look at this text and think that the Ephesians had any different scenario. So for them to suddenly see the wicked, ominous intent behind the entities that they were going to for help was a revelation to them that produced fear in their lives. They suddenly became very afraid. It would be almost like this, as if you had uh, lived with someone for a very long time. And had gotten perhaps close to them to a degree, but never, never real close. And then finally, you discovered after maybe a decade of living with them, that they were not who they portrayed themselves to be. They were actually murderous, perverted, and had been doing things outside of your knowledge that had you known about would have made you vomit. And fear for your life to know that they were sleeping next to you at night. And this is the kind of revelation that they get where suddenly they realize that all of these amulets and books and, and, and little trinkets that they have that are tributes to Artemis, tributes to the goddess of Diana in their homes, the t-shirts, the bumper stickers, the whole nine yards, the sayings, the traditions, their culture that was built upon it, they suddenly realized, man, these things all have an association to those things that beat the heck out of that guy and sent them screaming in fear, bleeding and naked, and they suddenly were like, well, then what's to keep me from that? What's to keep me from that? I, I don't want that. And, and I think they begin to realize in their minds that the entities that they have been worshiping in, in, in their idolatry, the entities that they've gone to, the, the women for fertility, the men uh, for the sake of having sons for prosperity, that they actually had ominous intentions. They were evil. And now, aware of the presence of evil, they begin to be afraid, but as a result of it, the name of Jesus is magnified. It means the name of Jesus is just blown up. Now everybody's thinking, Jesus, Jesus, why? Because Jesus is the one and only source of salvation from the darkness which they've now discovered themselves to be in the grip of. And, you know, I look at this, and while the believer is never to be afraid of darkness, I recognize two things. He is to have a healthy understanding of darkness in the sense that he is not to toy with darkness. Christians should never play with evil. But the unbeliever, 
Though the Christian has nothing to be afraid of so long as he walks with Christ. In fact, he exposes and overcomes the darkness. But the unbeliever should be afraid of darkness. And, and I wish and I pray that for those who don't really know the Lord that have this kind of second rate association to Jesus that they would come under the power of darkness sometime like I have in the past so that they would learn for just a moment in time what they're actually in the grip of. I remember when I had walked away from the Lord in the year 2000 and I was smoking marijuana and dabbling in uh, pornography and all kinds of things that I shouldn't have been messing with as a Christian, I was compromising. That by the grace of God, I remember the first time I made the decision to compromise with marijuana. I was in my garage. There was a guy that uh, worked with me at Chili's Restaurant here in St. Pete, and he'd come over and he had a joint. And he asked if I wanted to smoke it. My defenses had over the prior nine months been really whittled down, and I said, yeah, light it up, man. And I remember when I took a few tokes off that thing. Man, I had smoked pot every day from 14 to 19 when I went to prison. And now here I was at 25 years old. And when I toked that thing, I didn't get high. I got filled with paranoia and fear and anxiety like I never experienced before in my life. And I felt God say to me, sitting in a green lazy boy in the garage with Billy, this dude with dreadlocks and the other guy from Chili's, I felt him say, I'm giving you this one, but if you smoke it again, I'm going to let you get high and remember why you loved it. I kept the roach that night against what I knew to be right. I smoked that roach and I got high just like in the olden days. And I never stopped from that moment until I was in the back of a police car and ultimately, as a result, separated from my wife and daughter for five years because I violated my probation. I remember before that when God in His grace was throwing off the spiritual blinders, giving me a little insight into the spirit world, if you will. When I had started to dabble with pornography, nothing even real serious to those who are in pornography, but we just had Cinemax, which is, is not a good channel to have, especially after about 8 o'clock at night, probably during the day now, but this was years ago. And one night I got up about 2 o'clock in the morning, I walked out and I flipped on the TV, and right as I stood at the threshold of the living room where I had grabbed the controller to flip on the TV, there was a demonic presence that seized me that felt like sub-zero temperature and just stiffened my body. And, and I have never been more afraid up until that time in my life. I probably, I, I, without exaggerating, took three to five minutes to get back to my bedside inching because I was frozen. And I laid down and, and just shivered and prayed for God to have mercy on me. To keep me from whatever that dark power I had just felt was. And what was God saying to me? He was saying to me, son, I want you to look at something for a minute. You don't walk around aware of this. I want to show you what you've yielded yourself to. I want to show you what's in control of your life right now because you've yielded yourself to this. This wants to kill you. This wants to destroy you. I know you just think it's a joint. Oh, I, I know you just think it's a magazine. You just think it's, you know, a, a shot on Cinemax. Son, let, let me show you what you've yielded yourself to in walking away from me and compromising with sin. It's like the old story of, you know, the kid who... Uh, is out on the farm and he's, um, he's playing with these little worms. And there's another couple kids with him and they're all playing with the worms together. And one of the kids walks back up to the farmhouse and the old farmer says, what are you kids doing out there? And he says, well, we're just out there playing with the worms behind the shed. 
And the farmer who knew that his land was filled with pygmy rattlesnakes ran as fast as he could to get to where those kids were because what in their conception was nothing but a little worm was actually something deadly, a pygmy rattlesnake. And by the time he got there, it was too late. And the same is true when it comes to the power of darkness and when it comes to sin. We don't realize what it is that we're toying with. And when this happened, fear spread and they all began to have this new awareness of whose control they were actually under. And as a result, the name of the Lord was magnified. Verse 18 And many who believed came confessing and telling their deeds. That's real repentance. They run to Jesus. They flee to the refuge of the Savior because they realize that there is no escape. There's no salvation from darkness, from sin, from Satan, apart from Christ. And it's real. And you can see it in three ways. Number one, they come telling their deeds, they're confessing how they've been living, what they've been doing. And you know, I bet some of it was dark. I bet some of it was just nasty. And the beauty of the gospel is this. No, no one ought to ever be able to confess anything to me that causes me to stagger in my belief about whether or not God's grace is sufficient to provide forgiveness of it. No matter what they had done, the same Spirit that was testifying to them that there was salvation from darkness in Jesus was testifying that there was forgiveness of sin in Jesus. And so they came openly confessing their deeds. You don't see that happening a whole lot. In fact, most people's response to the Gospel in in churches today tends to just be that they come back next Sunday because they liked the music. Not that their life actually changes. Or that they come back next Sunday because the guy was slick enough to give his 40 minutes without offending, tiptoeing through the various tastes and flavors and likes and dislikes of the people. But... There's no concern for that here because men's souls are on the line. Paul recognizes that there's a battle for souls and now they recognize it. That their souls have been, the, been in the clutches of darkness and now as they come to Jesus, they're confessing their sin because they want to be clean. They want to be wide open and transparent and they believe that forgiveness is available. Verse 19, also many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. In this day, their, the psychology of their day was magic. Philosophy. The self-help is what I'm saying of their day was magic. See, that was their culture. There was no uh, psychologist down the road or self-help program or recovery center down the road that they could run to for help, but there were these magical remedies for whatever they might be facing. And they learned to use this stuff to their own benefit in these pagan cultures. But they had now realized that even though they had probably actually benefited from some of the stuff that they were doing, maybe physically, maybe financially, do you not think that Artemis, the god of fertility, was believed to actually be getting the women pregnant? They wouldn't have continued to go and make purchases of the various Uh, figurines. We'll see in a minute that there was a silversmith that about loses his mind over this because of the the threat that his commerce, his money, his economy might be destroyed because he was making these figurines. Darkness has real power. Satan has power. That's absolutely true. 
Satan has power, and guess where he got it? He got it from God. When Jesus was taken in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said to them, Now is your hour and the power of darkness. But he was taken by the sovereignty of God. He surrendered himself to it. Because he had a plan that was going to fool them all. When you look at the Old Testament, you see the power of darkness. You see that what was meant for evil in spite of that was used by God for good, but you see the power of darkness. You see Joseph thrown into a hole in the ground and sold to Midianite slave traders and then later thrown into prison for 12 years. You see the three Hebrew kids, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, thrown into an oven. You see Daniel thrown into a lion's den. And before the deliverance takes place, if you didn't know any better, Apparently, they've been defeated. Well, Joseph, you've been in there for 12 years. Satan has real power. If you don't believe that, you're not reading your Bible. Jesus referred to that power in Luke chapter 10 when he told his disciples, Behold, I give you power over all the power of the enemy to trample on scorpions and serpents, and nothing by any means will harm you. He acknowledged that the enemy had power. In Colossians, Paul says that we've been translated from the kingdom of darkness. Kingdoms have governments. Governments speak of authority and power. We've been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of His love. And so the enemy has power, and now all of these amulets and these books and these things are being brought out that represented their association to the enemy because they don't want anything to do with his power. They don't want anything to do with what he might be able to benefit them with. They don't care that, yeah, maybe there were some areas where Artemis was coming through. Listen, if you don't believe that false prophets can do signs and wonders, read Revelation. Chapter 13 and 14 says that the reason the Antichrist will be able to successfully deceive everyone whose name isn't written in the Lamb's book of life is because of the signs which he had the power to do. God said in the Old Testament, if a prophet comes to you and does a sign, the sign comes to pass and then says, hey, go follow other gods. God says, I'm testing you. See, that's pragmatism. Just because something works doesn't make it true. Just because you get a benefit from it doesn't make it true. Why? Because there's a way that seems right to man. It seems right for a while. What's wrong with this? It seems right for me to be rubbing my stones together and all of a sudden, you know, I feel great or my anxiety is gone or it seems right to sprinkle my pixie dust around and dance in a circle or whatever it might be because I get a benefit from it. That's pragmatism. And the only thing that makes something true is whether or not it is true. And the way you discover that is, does it line up with the Word of God? If it doesn't line up with the Word of God, it doesn't matter what it does for you. The enemy will make you rich. Satan will make you rich. Look at all the false prophets on TV. You couldn't get the gospel out of those programs if you patched a hundred of them together and tried to dissect it. Look at all of the more famous personalities in Christendom right now today. Most of them are filthy rich. That doesn't mean anything in the way of authenticating the veracity of their ministries. If it's not true, it's not true. And now they've realized that and they want no part of it. You know what? When, when I came to repentance after that, that time... And it took me being in the back of a police car and ending up in jail, even though the Lord was graciously working with me. 
before I was ultimately sent to prison and, and, and went off and, and did my time, I was able to come home for about three months. And that was when I found a church and began to serve the Lord again. And my wife came to repentance and so many thing, good things happened. But one of the first things I did, my wife took a pot plant that was bigger than our privacy fence and went and shoved it in the cash and carry dumpster because she didn't know what else to do with it. When I got home, I took all the alcohol out of my fridge and I started going through my CDs and I got stuff out of there that might seem completely benign, but at the time, for me, it had an association to the same wickedness that had enslaved me. I got rid of Pink Floyd. I got rid of Bob Marley. Because I felt just like he did too till the Lord opened my eyes and showed me what was behind my little amotivational romance with marijuana. And I just started to get rid of all those things because I didn't want any of that stuff. Turn with me real quick just to uh, take a little trip over to 2 Corinthians I want to read to you something Paul says to the Corinthians after some time has passed from them initially receiving the Lord. False prophets have begun to come in and they always take one or two tracks. They're either legalistic and they're trying to get you to do certain religious things in order to be made right with God or they're liberal and they're telling you that it doesn't matter how you live. And in this case, the Corinthians had started to flirt around with the world again. And so Paul is going to say to them, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial, the devil? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said. And then he quotes the Lord. I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, and then he quotes the Lord again, verse 17, Come out from among them. Therefore, come out from among them. Be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean. Or as Isaiah says in the King James Version, do not touch the unclean thing. And I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. One more verse there. Chapter 7, verse 1. Therefore, having these promises, what? That you can be the sons and daughters of God. Beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Back over to the text. They were getting rid of every association. You think about these people. They saw people getting healed from sweat rags that came from the Apostle Paul that because of their association with Jesus Christ, God was allowing the touch of a sweat rag to produce a miracle. Now you think they didn't figure that thing in reverse? That if the sweat rags from Paul had power vested in them to heal for the propagation of the gospel? You don't think they realized that all these religious devilish trinkets they had also by their association were tied in with demonic spirits? You better bet they did. And they got rid of it. They got rid of all of it. We should, we should really do that. Amen. We should really do that because... Even if there was no supernatural entity tied to some garbage back in your home, on your CD rack, or in your bookshelf, or in your old pictures, even if there wasn't anything in your movie selection in the way of a demonic entity where this had been directly associated with someone's absolute demise at the hand of demons, it still represents a temptation. 
And they didn't want to deal with any of it. Verse 20, so in this way, the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. You know what this whole thing was about? The miracles, the sons of Sceva getting their butt kicks, the bonfire that happens in, in front of everyone. And by the way, 50,000 pieces of silver is the equivalent of about a million dollars in our day. When you really come to Christ, you'll not only be willing to confess, you'll take action and it'll be sacrificial. He will almost always ask you to give something up that hurts. In fact, He will always ask you to. And you will have to let go of things that cost you for letting go of them. But it was in this way, through all of these events, it's like the battle royale between the enemy and the Lord in Ephesus, demonic stronghold of their day, rivaled probably by nowhere else but Rome. And it was all about the spread of the gospel, the word or the message of the Lord. Verse 20, you know what's so cool? Paul wasn't even present when most of that stuff happened. He wasn't there when people got healed from the rags. He wasn't there when the seven sons of Sceva got beat up. He might not even have been there when they did the bonfire. I don't know, but I'll tell you, that is so cool that God got the glory for all of this. And Paul is fine with it. Verse 21, when these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the Spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem saying, after I have been there, I must see Rome also. So we sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a time. So he sends them ahead because we learn from the letter he's written while here, incidentally, to the Corinthians, to the Romans, and to some others, that he's having them take up a collection for Jerusalem. I think it's so amazing that Paul never forgets about the church even when he's on mission. Never forgets about Jerusalem but has a heart, even though they didn't always treat him right in Jerusalem, to get the churches that have been established as a result of his ministry to take up an offering for Jerusalem. But you know what really gets me in those two verses? Paul says, after I've done this, after I've gone to Jerusalem, I must also see Rome. I guarantee you, the enemy does not like that plan. Rome in this day is the capital of the entire world. It's where at this time Claudius Caesar is. Esteemed to be God. And Paul is saying, I won't be finished with the commission that God has given me until I take this thing to the very end. And for me, the end of the line is Rome. And you'll read, we will together in chapters ahead, that that was actually the end of the line for Paul. Tradition tells us that eventually he was murdered in Rome after having successful ministry there. See, we don't ever stop in publishing the gospel until there's nobody left to share it with. As long as there's lost people that are under the power of darkness anywhere in the world, we can never stop speaking and preaching and working on behalf of the spread of the gospel. We can never do it. But you know Satan hates that plan. Satan did not like the Apostle Paul's plan. Look at the next verse. Verse 22, so we, uh, verse 23, and about that time there arose a great commotion about the way. The way was a name for Christianity in this day. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Diana, that's the god Artemis, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. He called them together with the workers of similar occupation and said, men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned many people saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. Paul is preaching wherever he goes against idolatry. Paul is saying wherever he goes, 
if you made it with your hands, if you conceived it in your mind and painted it with a brush, engraved it with a tool, built it with a hammer and nail, you can just know it ain't God. Because God is not worshipped through the things that can be made with men's hands. And so he's making his case because he is hot. He's about to lose his commerce. Verse 27, so not only is the this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed. Notice, whom all Asia and the world worshipped. Paul, by preaching the gospel for two years in Ephesus, had made an impact on society throughout the entire world. He was beginning before he ever left Ephesus to make an impact on the entire world as a result of preaching the gospel in Ephesus. I want to point something out in a minute. Keep that in your mind. Verse 28, now when they heard this, they were full of wrath and cried out saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. So the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, Paul's travel companions. And when Paul wanted to go into the people, the disciples would not allow him. They thought, Paul, man, they're going to kill you. Then some of the officials of Asia who were his sent to him pleading that he would not venture into the theater. The word there in the Greek, officials, is Asiarchs. These were top leaders, and they were saying, bro, if you go in there, we love you, but we can't protect you. Some therefore, verse 32, cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused and most of them did not know why they had come together. See, that is a work of the enemy. Wherever confusion exists, they don't even know why they're together. They've got Gaius and they've got Aristarchus. They don't even have Paul. And they're hollering and shouting, Great is Diana, and one group is saying they're there for one reason. Another group is saying they're there for another reason. What did these two guys do that you're about to kill? We don't know. It just had to be bad, so we're here yelling and screaming, and we're going to kill them. And that's how irrational Satan can get you. And you know how he does it? You know how he does it? By stirring up emotion. Emotion. If you get under the grip of your emotions, they will drive you to kill and to hurt people that you actually had no problem with at all. It's confusion when you listen to anything other than the voice of God, the Word of God. If you experience that ever, you're like, man, there's so many voices. The word confusion means poured in together. A bunch of voices poured in together. If that's your mind, that's your life, that's from the devil. James says that. Where confusion, envy, bitterness are, sensual, earthly, devilish. You know how you get out of that? By going to the Word of God and you let the Word of God speak to you its unchangeable truth and then you bank on it, you stand on it, you act on it. Even if it doesn't seem to be in the moment the right thing to do. So there's all this confusion. Verse 33, And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward. And Alexander, this is just a random Jew, who was a spokesman for them. Alexander motioned with his hand and wanted to make his defense to the people. What's the point? Well, he's going to let them know, hey, you know, this ain't about us Jews. This is those Christian guys. We didn't even like those guys. So we just want to settle the record here. You know, don't, don't be looking at us. <coughs> Doesn't even get to do it. Verse 34, but when they found out that he was a Jew... All with one voice, they cried for about two hours, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. They're overcome with emotion. I stood uh, three years ago in front of a Hare Krishna worship set in D.C. And uh, my um, 
vision of it will you know never dissipate because it was mostly kids and that just made it really stick out in my mind but they would worship chanting Krishna Krishna over and over and over again until they were sweating and crying hurting their hands beating the drums some with a, a false dark supernatural smile some looking like they were in anguish remember when we stood there three years ago just in, just for probably an hour or something and they just got louder and harder and they don't even know why they're they're doing it they don't they didn't know Jason and I from a hole in the wall but they just had that incitement that came from the enemy they were stirred up in their emotions and he blinded them through that and the enemy does that so often look verse 35 finally this is probably one of those Asiarchs that Paul is friends with and when the city clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple guardian of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Zeus? Or some of your versions may say heaven or the sky. Therefore, since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. And then notice this verse. And even maybe draw a line from it to verse 26 if you do that kind of stuff in your Bible. For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of your goddess. Therefore, if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a case against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring their charges against one another. But if you have any other inquiry to make, it'll be determined in a lawful assembly. For we're in danger of being called in question for today's uproar, there being no reason which we may give to account for this disorderly gathering. And when they had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. So this guy comes out. Obviously, they've uh, got some facial recognition of this guy because they're shouting. The crowd, as soon as they see him, pipes down, and then he begins to speak. And I think the most important thing that he said was in verse 37, For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of your goddess. You know what I see here? The sons of Sceva go out to pick a fight with the devil. That is ridiculous. You don't pick a fight with the devil, even as a Christian who's filled with the power of God. Jesus taught us to pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are in debt to us. Lead us not into temptation. We don't count ourselves strong enough to face temptation. Lead us not into temptation, but by contrast, deliver us from the evil one. Jesus taught a humble position in prayer relevant to the power of darkness. We don't rush in where angels fear to tread. Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 2 as well as does Jude that the false prophets who despise authority speak evil of in, in the King James word is dignitaries. It means the heavenly ones or the glorious ones. They walk around talking about devils and demons like they have some power of their own. And not even the disciples who were sent out two by two with Jesus when they came back rejoicing that even the demons were subject to them were commended for that. Jesus said, don't rejoice that demons are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Rejoice because of the reason that demons are subject to you. That you're a citizen of the kingdom. You have the authority of the kingdom of God on your life. If that were not true, none of them would be subject to you at all. So rejoice that your name is part of that registry. And so, Paul takes that same theology into his ministry with the slave girl a few chapters back in Philippi. It says she was really taunting them day after day, and Paul didn't do anything about it till finally he became annoyed and he cast the demon out of her. He wasn't quick to just react because his agenda was for souls. It was not to put on a show. 
It was for souls. And whenever the enemy got in the way of a soul being liberated, then that enemy would get nixed. And he wouldn't have any problem walking in the boldness of the Lord's authority when doing so. But outside of that, there's no chasing down devils. In fact, when you look at the text that we've just read, what you see is that the Apostle Paul has one singular focus. That the gospel would be spread. He's not on a campaign against Diana, the false god Artemis. He's not on a campaign against the magic books. So far as we know, he's not been even preaching against magic books and things like this. He's not lobbying the government in this day to shut down the centers of pagan worship and harlotry. He's just preaching the gospel. And as a natural result of that, when the heart of mankind is seized, these things begin to topple. The kingdom of hell falls down. Look at what we've got going, around, going on around us. And we'll, we'll close with this. Last week, 25 Coptic uh, Egyptians slain by Muslims. Uh, about a month ago, a four-year-old thrown off the Skyway Bridge just after being embraced. 9-11... The Batman movie massacre. Or two days ago, a young man named Stephen who shook his three-month-old baby and banged its head until it was fractured and dead because he had to get up a second time that night to quiet it since mom had to work in the morning. Are these people monsters? No. They're you and me. Amen. You have the same seeds in you that were inside of every one of them. And the only thing that you lack to do what they have done is the water, the circumstances that are just right to fall on those seeds of wickedness, get them to produce and bear wicked fruit in your life. Right. You can't legislate any laws that will prevent babies from getting thrown off bridges. You can't legislate even to stop abortion. Oh, you may legislate to get it uh, stopped legally. But the flesh is going to find a way to do what it is intent upon doing no matter what law you place on it. See, I want to leave you with two things here. Paul's focus was the Great Commission. It was the spread of the Gospel. And Paul's weapon is artillery was the Word of God. He talked to the Ephesians in chapter 6 about spiritual warfare. He gave them one weapon, the sword of the Spirit, which he said is the Word of God. He tells the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not of this world, but they're mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. We don't fight with law. We don't fight with psychology. We don't fight with guns. We don't fight with medicine. Now we may use all of these things to some degree or another as consistent with the Word of God, but never should any one of these things become the weapon that we think will liberate people that are captives to sin and darkness. There's only one weapon and it is the Word of God. It is the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And there's only one goal. Listen, the enemy will work hard to try to give you a cause. And if that cause is not the salvation of mankind, listen, I'm telling you, every cause other than that must bow and become lesser to that one overarching goal. You and I are pilgrims. We're sojourners. Jesus is coming back and there's people who should He come today are going to die and go to hell because they don't know the forgiveness that comes as a result of His shed blood. There isn't anything more important than this and there's only one way to accomplish it by the Gospel 
through the power of the Holy Spirit. We're going to pray, and then if there's anyone that would like to talk or pray, uh, you're welcome to come up. We'll have a couple couple of the elders and other guys up here that can pray and talk with you. And if you have a concern about your soul, boy, I wish you would come up. And, and if you're not right with God, you don't know that you're right with God, I'm, I'm, I just want you to look at me and remember, I'm going to be praying that you get so concerned. I'm going to be praying that you get so deathly afraid of darkness. Because if that's what it takes to push you to the Savior, I've seen God do it. I pray that He would do it again. Father, we praise You for Your goodness. Lord, we worship You. There's none like You. We just give You the praise, Lord, that You alone deserve. You are the God above all gods. You're great, greatly to be praised, Lord. Do a work, I pray, in my heart, God. Do a work in their hearts. May we truly cleanse ourselves, Lord, from all the filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Things you can see and things you can't, Lord. May we chuck them, get rid of them, burn them up, Jesus. To get closer to you that the enemy would have no power, no hold, no influence over our lives whatsoever, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would invite Men and women, boys and girls, Lord, to join the battle today to liberate people from the kingdom of darkness. May it be done in Jesus' precious name. Amen.